Leadership is under scrutiny in the world today, especially in a world that is increasingly polarized in so many ways, both in political views and in moral convictions. It's interesting that private conversations between world leaders end up on the front page news the next day. Backstabbing among leaders is actually normal. And leaders can share their waking musings with the world in seconds. A decade ago, it would be fair to say that strong leadership was suspect because of highly publicized corruption and lying, and because, well, because of all these things, many didn't trust those in authority. Now today, the landscape is changing a little bit. Authority is still held in low regard, but there's been a shift. People now line up behind polarizing politicians, and they go to war with their words. If you don't believe me, sometime read the comment section under online news articles. I've stopped doing that, by the way. It's bad for my blood pressure. <laughs> Now, why am I bringing all this up to you today? Well, the way the world acts towards its leaders, the attitude that people have towards leadership, actually has infiltrated the church, especially in two of the world's ways. First, leaders who are appointed by God by his people, through his people to lead, are often by the church or people in the church suspected to be corrupt unless they prove otherwise. Now, that hasn't, it hasn't helped that church leaders, both full-time clergy and lay leaders alike, have fallen, and then the news of their fall has spread like wildfire through social media. So that hasn't helped. But here's the result of that. The ancient instruction to the church is often scoffed at. Do you remember these words? Hebrews 13. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this that their work may be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. So that's one way that the ways of the world have infiltrated the church. Here's another way, a second way. If church leaders, whether it be pastors or any type of leader, have a strong personality and gifts, then sometimes people in the church follow the way of our upside down world. They tend to line up behind their preferred leader and blindly support them, which often leads to division and rifts within Christ's body. Now, there was a church that was already experiencing that type of disunity just four years after it was planted. The missionary statesman who planted the church, he stayed there almost two years and then he was followed up by another man who was a very skilled orator who discipled or tried to disciple the new believers. And instead of being led by God's Holy Spirit, the congregation turned to the world's idea of leadership. Secular wisdom. Now they had started well, they'd received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but now instead of listening to the Holy Spirit, united around the message of the cross, they began to see leadership through the lenses of the world, forming Loyalties, loyalties to certain human leaders in the church. And this backfired terribly because people became entrenched. They were right. And those who were following the other church leaders were wrong. Perhaps even evil, they proudly proclaimed. Now, if you've been with us the last several weeks, you know the church I'm talking about. It's the church at Corinth. 
And even though it sounds like it could be a church in our city, it was actually in ancient times, ancient time and place. The church in Corinth, just about 22 years after Christ ascended into heaven, it was a church filled with believers who didn't behave like they were taught by the Holy Spirit, acting like unbelievers as they quarreled, filled with jealousy towards one another. And the Apostle Paul had a lesson to teach them that we all need to be reminded of today. In a day when we're influenced by the ways of our upside down world. It's a message about how spirit-led churches will function. Here's the message. Spirit-led churches adopt God's leadership model. We've been studying the book of 1 Corinthians, and our theme is following Jesus in an upside-down world. And before we turn to our passage this morning, let's pause and let's ask for God's help. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we praise your name. Thank you for giving us your holy word, your revelation to your people. As we read it and dig into it this morning, help us again hear from your Holy Spirit. If there are attitudes that we are holding on to that need to change, challenge, and convict us, Lord, if there are things that are holding us back in our faith in you, help us cast them aside. We need your help today. In Jesus' name, amen. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you're using one of the blue Bibles in front of you, page 808 should take you to that page. I encourage you to take out your bulletin. There is an outline on the back. As you're finding that passage, let's just review for a moment. Last week, we learned that humanity is divided into two camps. Do you remember that? One's with the Spirit and one's without the Spirit. We briefly at the end identified a third group, those who are, have received Christ but are still worldly, people who are controlled by the flesh, literally carnal Christians, mere infants in Christ. They may have been Christians for a long time, for a while, but they still operate by the world's principles. The flesh or the old sinful nature is the part of them that's dominating their personality. But with that in mind, let's read the first section of chapter 3. This is the Word of God. Brothers, I could not address you as, a, as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you are not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? Paul was telling the Corinthians in chapter 3, verse 1, that they were in that third category that we were just talking about. Their spiritual immaturity placed them there, and they were clinging on to these worldly ideas, behaving like ordinary people who do not have Christ not measuring up to the image of Christ who is dwelling within them by his Holy Spirit. And Paul proves his point. He says, he, he actually returns to the theme in chapter one that we looked at a number of weeks ago. And there, if you remember, he confronted their church split, which claimed allegiance to several different church leaders. And now he returns to that. He returns to that attitude that's splitting the church. And he starts off this section with a word, brothers, or brethren, which actually means brothers and sisters. Now, why did he use that term? Why didn't he say, you rebels, or you disobedient children? Why did he say brethren? Well, he wants to remind them that his words are motivated by affection for them, strong affection, 
He's also reminding them that they are brethren of one another, that they should be united and not divided. And Paul reminds them of the time that he introduced them to Christ, the time that he introduced them to the message of the gospel, the good news of the cross. Back then, he had treated them as mere infants in Christ. Well, why is that? Well, when people become believers, they begin this lifelong journey towards spiritual maturity. And although they had started very well, it was now several years later, and they still hadn't grown, still drinking milk, spiritually speaking, not solid food. And just like newborns choke on solid food, the Corinthian church still were unable to take the solid food of Christian teaching. Why? Well, even though they should have abandoned the worldly practices of several years ago, they still were hanging on to them. And evidence was found in their jealousy and their quarreling, acting like mere humans who didn't have the Holy Spirit. Verse 4, I follow Paul. And the other side would be, well, I follow Apollos. And Paul is like this parent saying to fighting children, this is enough. You're done fighting. Grow up. You're acting like those outside of the Christian family. And in his confrontation, Paul needed to teach them some important lessons about God's leadership model for his church, for a spirit-filled church, and how it looks completely different than that of the world. Here's the first lesson. A spirit-led congregation recognizes that church leaders are only instruments in God's hands. Follow along as I read verses 5 through 9. What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to us each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers, and you are God's field, God's building. Now in this passage, Paul uses two illustrations. The first is that of agriculture. And he is saying that Paul and Apollos were like farmers whose duty was to sow and tend to the young plants. And in time, a harvest would be their reward. That was their part. But then there was God's part. Only he could make the seed germinate and grow. He said, that's what it's like in the church. And then he uses the example of construction. God was building this unified church, and it was to be one building, not a fragmented, divided church. And as the harvest belonged to God, so was this finished building. It all belonged to God. Did you catch Paul's point? They were not to line up behind church leaders as if they were celebrities. It's God who is the all-powerful, sovereign, supreme leader. Church leaders are merely his instruments. God brings spiritual growth. The leaders are fellow workers, like a team of people, he says, working in a field, except this time it's God's field. And so church leaders and the congregation must learn this principle of God's leadership model. You know, Jesus had a similar confrontation with his disciples. Listen into Luke chapter 22, verse 24 to 27. Also a dispute arose among them as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. And Jesus said to them, the kings of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who exercise authority of them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who's at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. See, church leaders are 
servants, instruments in God's hands, and they have no power or authority of their own. You see, within the church, those who are leaders are a part of a joint venture with God. So here's the first implication. It's not part of God's plan to treat church leaders as celebrities. All of God's servants are useful, no matter who you are. Each has a particular job in God's greater purpose of growing his church to be more like Christ. So it doesn't matter who God has asked you to lead, whether it's your children in your home, or whether it's a Sunday school class, or an usher station, or a group of elders, or a small group, or a discussion as a host at the table at community dinner. We're all part of a team. We're all his instruments. Here's another implication. Leaders are not indispensable. God can replace a leader just like that. They're only instruments in God's hand, which leads us to Paul's next part of the lesson. A mature, spirit-filled congregation recognizes that God holds church leaders to a very high standard. Follow along in your Bibles, verses 10 through 17. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. We've been singing about that all morning. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Now, Paul moves into now that second metaphor, a metaphor that the Corinthians would have been very, very familiar with, construction. Careful construction was huge in Corinth. Wendy and Rebecca and I uh, took a few pictures while we were in Corinth, And we're still surprised to see structures still standing that were around in Paul's day. According to Paul, this spiritual building was monumental. It was like a large colonnaded hall or a temple. And such buildings need very solid foundations. In verses 10 and 11, Paul appeals, be careful how you build. And he reminded them that the true church already has a solid foundation that cannot be laid again. The foundation is Jesus Christ. It was laid by the apostles and by their proclamation and their confession of the Lord Jesus. In another passage, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, the Bible says that God's church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Jesus Christ himself as the chief cornerstone. And it goes on to say in verses 21 to 22, in him, meaning Christ, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Now today, many people try to build their Christianity without Christ. On a foundation of maybe good works, or humanism, or science. Some popular uh, media darlings, they call themselves Christian, but they betray their foundation by publicly ignoring the Lord Jesus' teaching on love, and on purity, and on compassion, and on holy living. They're not really part of the church. 
built on the solid rock of Christ. In the physical world, foundations for buildings are critical. Look at this picture that was taken just over six years ago. Inadequate foundations for a four-story building was one of the three reasons given by investigators for a building collapsing in northern Rwanda, killing six people, burying dozens more alive. And as I was reading, I learned this week that one of the main reasons for building collapse is that the foundations are too weak. Why do people build buildings with inadequate foundations? It's because they're very, very costly. Foundations are very costly. They can, I found out that they can cost up to half of an entire building project, just the foundation alone. That's hard to spend, especially when it's just covered up and no one ever sees it. I remember last year when our dirt floor was dug out downstairs that there was a line of cement trucks all the way down Pape Avenue. They came in one after another and continually poured. And it was a very costly endeavor. It's a solid floor that will last for a long time. And what did we do with it right after it was poured? We covered it up with vinyl. And yet it's so important. It's so important. Back to the church. God holds the church leaders to a very high standard when it comes to spiritual building. And Paul reminded, verse 11, the Corinthians, that their foundation had already been laid, the foundation of the Lord Jesus, our Messiah. And as we saw last week, some of the church leaders began to dig out that foundation and replace it with their own foundation, building with now human wisdom and pretense, and not the message of the cross. And so here, Paul urges church leaders to build with spiritual materials that last. This was real concern of Paul for the Corinthian church, and it really should be for us today. Erecting the spiritual building of the church body must be done competently, using the right materials, because one day, the Apostle Paul says, there will be a final inspection. And that inspection will show up any and all defects. The inspection day when Jesus Christ returns to planet Earth. And you have a choice, Paul says. You can build using two sets of construction materials. Now, of course, Paul's contrast is metaphor. But he's saying, if a raging fire came, what would burn up? Here's what wouldn't burn up, he says. Gold, silver, and costly stones. Well, what qualifies as gold, silver, and costly stones? We spoke last week of how God's Holy Spirit reveals God himself through his holy word. He illuminates God's wisdom when it comes to the cross. Let me ask the kids here today. Does God's word count as something that will last for eternity? How many of the kids think yes? That's a good answer. Psalm 119, verse 89 says, Your word, Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. The apostle Peter echoed Isaiah when he wrote in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 24 and 25, For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. And so a congregation that is led by the Holy Spirit will look for leaders that hold to a very high standard in their building materials, what they use to build with. They build with the principles and the teachings of God's holy word. A spirit-filled church seeks leaders who allow God's word to penetrate their lives. Now here's the alternative to building with gold and silver and precious stones. Things that will just burn up in a second. Wood, hay, and stubble. What types of things is Paul referring to? Well, the context from the last few weeks that we've been discovering in the book of 1 Corinthians tells us that attempting to build with human wisdom is like constructing a flimsy house of straw. 
We saw last week when we turned to the ways of the corporate world or popular politics instead of the word of God that this is the world's wisdom. But it isn't God's wisdom. Paul's saying here that it's wood, it's hay, it's stubble. One will survive the fire of the day of the Lord and one won't. And the picture here is of a fire just sweeping through a building. Now, the, the people living in Corinth would have been very used to wildfires. Wendy and Rebecca and I saw firsthand the devastation that a fire like this can have. This picture that I took here, less than a year ago, this used to be a very popular spot, a luxury restaurant overlooking the sea. In our photo here, all that's left is the charred remnants. And Paul speaks of this searching scorching test, like into a hot sweeping fire. It purges out the dross. It leaves behind just the pure metal. It consumes the combustible. And this test will occur when Christ returns, and he will test the quality of each person's work. And it's interesting that he talks about the quality of each person's work, not the quantity. According to our chapter in verse 13, And by the way, this applies to all of us within the church, not just the elders and teachers. Each person, each person will bear responsibility for his or her contribution to the building and will receive a reward or a loss on the basis of the quality of their workmanship. Now, I will add that those who teach are held to a higher standard. James chapter 3, verse 1 says this, Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. And a week doesn't go by in my life without God reminding me of this. I am not indispensable. I must remain holy because the Lord Jesus Christ is holy. And the people of his church are his body, they are the temple of the Holy Spirit, and he takes very seriously his holy temple. And if I, or if any church leader defile the temple, our very lives are in danger. Look back at chapter three, verse 16 and 17. Paul's addressing the church. Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple? and that God's spirit dwells in your midst. Now, we often think about our individual bodies as being the temple of the Holy Spirit, which we learn later on in 1 Corinthians. But here, Paul is saying you, plural. Do you not know, he's saying, Corinthian church, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? And then Paul adds these chilling words. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred, and you together are that temple. I'd like to think that God's somehow speaking figuratively or, or exaggerating in this text. When I was a teenager, a man very successfully infiltrated our church. My dad had been the pastor there for 15 and a half years, and the man infiltrated the church after my dad left. I actually stayed for the rest of the year to finish my high school year, and my parents moved away. And uh, this man was very publicly, publicly wicked in his behavior. He bought silence in the church with money. And some of the church leaders, they feared him because they thought the church couldn't survive financially without his money, And so they started caving into his demands. He was, what was he doing? He was tearing up God's temple, his church. In the evening services, he started um, demanding that he play the piano for the offertory. Why not? He gave the church the piano and the organ. And uh, he couldn't play, but people clapped anyway. And then... That wasn't enough for him, so he came up to the pulpit and he wanted to read the scriptures. So they let him do it. I remember. One night, very shortly after I had uh, left to rejoin my parents, we got a phone call. People were in panic. One night he came up to the pulpit, he opened up the Bible, and no words came out of his mouth. His face turned gray, and he was dead before he hit the platform. And that night, a holy fear of God 
gripped my heart. Because God hates it when people mess with his bride, the church. Paul ends this chapter reminding us what a spirit-led congregation recognizes. Verses 18 through 23, they won't look to any leaders for their identity, even godly leaders, because a spirit-led congregation recognizes that our real heritage is found in Jesus Christ and in him alone. Let's finish chapter three, starting verse 18. Do not deceive yourselves. If any of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then, no more boasting about men. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Now Paul is reminding them what he is just, he's doing a summary of what he's been teaching them the last several chapters. He says, don't deceive yourselves. He's reminding them what we learned last week, that wisdom of the world and wisdom of God are upside down from each other. And this time Paul relates that to their flawed church leadership model, a model that exalted themselves and human leaders, and Paul insists that they stop boasting about people. They need to forsake the wisdom of this age, secular values that cause them to live spiritually immature lives. Instead, he says something that's interesting, all things are yours. And what did Paul mean by that? Well, he wanted to give them a proper Christ-centered perspective, All things are the Lord's inheritance, and he shares that inheritance with all believers. Ephesians 1.13 says this, and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. We are all, those of us who are saved, are all in Christ. And the inheritance of this Corinthian congregation included the blessing of leadership of Paul and Apollos and Cephas or Peter, Gifts of God to the church, not sources for division. But not only that, the world, life, death, he says, the present and the future also belonged to the church because Christ controls all these things and he's placed them under the feet of his faithful followers. Brothers and sisters, this doesn't just apply to the Corinthian church, but to us as well. We all share these blessings equally including the leadership of those that God's placed over us. None of us have any basis for divisions. Our heritage is in Jesus Christ. He has given us all these things. Calvary Church has been blessed by God over the last 90 years. The Lord Jesus, the head of our church, has enriched us with godly members and elders and pastors who have served him well. I was just thinking about this the other day as the, over the, the 90 years we started looking through some archives and we realized that some who are now with the Lord mortgaged their homes to pay for our gym, our missionary hall, and our youth wing. They're still being used for God's glory. Others have worked tirelessly teaching children, children all the way up to seniors, the word of God. Some people in the congregation have left family and friends and the comfort of our society here to work in places like Africa and Bolivia and Indonesia for the sake of the gospel. And we honor them and we honor their sacrifice. And ultimately, we honor their Savior, who gave them to us to build up his church. Why do we honor the Savior above all? Because we, as a church led by the Holy Spirit, adopt God's leadership model. Amen. Let's pray. Father, our prayer is that we, as we enter into the next 90 years, that we'll stay united 
not following secular wisdom, the wisdom of the world. And our prayer is that we will heed the message to the Corinthian church, that the leaders are mere servants, instruments in your hands, and that you hold them to the high standard of building carefully with materials that you have provided. We pray that we will gain our heritage, our identity, not in our leaders, but in Christ alone. In his holy name we pray, amen.